Hello, I'm Sabrina here with Jeff Melvoin today, joining us at Oxford Brookes University. Hi, welcome. <laughs> Thank you, it's nice to be here. Um, I have some questions for you. No um, what advice would you give students like us who plan on plan and dream on having such a successful and established international career like yourself? <laughs> well, for one thing, I think it's really important to hang on to those dreams because uh, this business has always relied on resilience and determination and uh, the conditions are changing all the time. It's a very exciting but very bewildering time to enter into the television business. So I think the most important thing is to remember why you want to do this and, uh, and to be flexible and to be ambitious enough to be patient, that uh, opportunities um, don't always appear at the time that you want them. It's, it's, it's not always exactly what you want at the time, but, um, but I think if you keep your eye on, on your goals and work diligently and really believe in what it is you're trying to do, uh, I think that's the biggest key to success. It's really that passion for what you want to do and not letting go of that and recognizing that you can't get there in one step. Thank you. Uh, would you say there are good opportunities currently for young people who are entering the industry now? You know, if I had to be strictly honest, I'd say that there have been better times to enter the business. We're going through a period of contraction, but I think that the question is somewhat irrelevant to somebody who really wants to be in the business, because it shouldn't matter what the business conditions are. It should matter that you want to do it and you're going to find a way to make it happen. Sometimes uh, it's easier than others. Um, but in easy times, some people have a hard time getting in, and in tough times, some people actually find it breaks open for them uh, quicker than they might have thought, more quickly than they might have thought. So, um, you know, honestly, if you take a look at any of the indications in terms of number of productions and, and budgets, uh, it's a period of contraction, and that's just going to be the way it is for the next 12 months to two years, probably. But like I said, that shouldn't matter to somebody starting out. What should matter is... Um, you're determined to do it, you're going to find an opportunity to get started, and you're going to make your way. Um, considering the impact that AI has had on the film industry so far, what are your expectations? <laughs> you know, that's a question that I get asked a lot. Uh, a lot of people are talking about AI. For one thing, AI isn't just one thing. AI covers a whole host of uh, different applications. And, and I think my general response is I think writers have less to fear from AI right now than actors and other performers and graphic artists because the, the, the software already exists to, kind of, to, to, to literally take jobs away from those people. Mm -hmm. um, Mid-journey, you know, if you use something like that, I don't know if you're familiar with that program, but if you want to make a deck, you can give it instructions and it'll generate beautiful graphics that replaced what an artist might have done in the past. Um, if you're an actor, there's a general concern that they can scan you and put you inside a box, so to speak, and, uh, and reproduce your image uh, and make you speak and say anything you want. We know that technology exists. For writers, it's, it's, so that's, that's legitimate. And, and uh, SAG was very, SAG Afro was very concerned about that when they went on strike. And I'm not quite sure all the details. I don't think they got everything that they wanted, uh, but, but I think they tried to put up some guardrails against how it can be used. But for writers, um, it's a more nuanced situation. And um, I'd start by saying that if the studios could replace writers with machines, they would. Um, anything that would save them money, uh, th they'd do it. But I don't think a machine is yet capable of doing what a human sensibility can do. Mm -hmm. And used properly, I think AI is, AI is a great research tool. It's a great database uh, uh, scraper. You can find out all sorts of information uh, by asking the right questions. And what we got in the Writers Guild strike, this past strike that was just settled, was provisions that no, no AI could become a writer. Um, but at the same time, I know writers, if, if we rail against the studios using AI to generate ideas that they gave us, that's one thing. But if you're given an assignment as a writer, there's nothing to stop you from going home and typing into AI. Well, give me three ideas to satisfy these plot conditions. And then you'd have to massage those. Um, but it could be a useful tool. Uh, on a less um, creative side, uh, if you're doing a film um, about ransom, uh, somebody's being held for ransom, you could say to ChatGBT, give me the, the last, give me any ransom movies that have been made in the last 20 years, and it'll start spitting out that stuff. And that information is available if you're willing to go on to uh, Wikipedia or any other different uh, sites. What ChatGBT does faster and probably more comprehensively than you could do it yourself, so it saves you time. So in that sense, um, I, I think that AI can be a real asset, uh, but we're still just beginning to understand all the capabilities 
And I think that for writers and for everybody, it's, it's, it's important not to be chicken little and say that the sky is falling and saying AI is terrible. You're not gonna, you know, the genie is already out of the bottle. You're not gonna put the genie back in the bottle. So the question is, what is it? How is it being used? What should we be concerned about? How can it help us? And uh, how can we develop rules so that it's used responsibly? And uh, so in the short term for writers, like I said, the short term is I, I, I don't see a great threat. But for performers and artists, I think they have a lot to be concerned about, and we have to be very careful. Also in relation to strikes, um, I'm right. sure you're aware of what's going on with the university at the moment. Yes. Um, what are your thoughts on, on this, and do you believe that this, these courses should be more invested by I, the I do. I mean, obviously, my, my investment is in the humanities and liberal arts. That's what I studied at college. I was an American history and literature major, and I remember people asking me, my parents' friends, saying, what are you going to do with that when you graduate? And I said, well, I'm not sure exactly, but I, I'm really interested in this, and I've got to believe it's going to lead to, uh, to an interesting career. Um, this cutting back on the humanities and, and the arts is something that's happening in the United States as well, and I think it's alarming. Uh, I think that while the sciences and other disciplines are getting a lot of attention, we can't forget that what the humanities there are there to do is to remind us why we do anything, what's important, what should we be investing in, what, what, what matters and what doesn't matter. And science doesn't ask those questions. And uh, so I think, it's, um, I think it's alarming. I'm totally in sympathy with the faculty and students here. Um, I don't want to stir up any uh, controversy more than it's already been stirred up, but no, I'm a big believer in humanities. And just to give you a, a, a capsule example is um, I wrote my thesis in college on American detective fiction because it interested me and I thought it'd be fun. When I got out of college and realized I wanted to make my living as a writer, I started as a journalist and I hadn't done any journalism in college. I'd done some in high school. So I used my thesis on detective fiction uh, to come to the attention of the person who ended up hiring me for a news service who ended up being a great detective fan. So that was my submission piece, and it got me my first job. Seven years later, that led to a job at Time Magazine. I was a correspondent for five years with Time Magazine in New York and Boston and LA. And when I decided I wanted to write scripts, the first script, when I asked a friend of mine how I could break into the TV business, and he said, well, pick a show out there that you think is, is interesting. And this uh, detective show, Remington Steele, had just come on the air with Pierce Brosnan and Stephanie Zimbalist. And I said, that's a field I know something about. And so my thesis was, uh, because that show spoofed a lot of detective stuff, uh, the more knowledge you had of what had been done, the better off you were. And so my thesis served me in a very substantial way in terms of making my way with that show. And that was my first show in the business. So it's just one example, um, I mean, there's two examples, but two examples in one career of how following liberal arts, something that really interested me for its own sake, actually led to very pragmatic uh, professional opportunities on the other end. So, um, that, so anyway, you're, uh, you're, you're talking to the right person when it comes to supporting the liberal arts because um, I think it's essential. Amazing, thank you so much. Okay.